Good evening. Uh, welcome from snowy Larchmont, New York. My name is Mitch Weisberg. I'm here for EdChat Interactive, and uh, we have uh, we have an experiment today. Uh, tonight we're going to be uh, talking with Jeff Madlock and Dave Henderson, and we're going to be talking. We're going to hopefully have a discussion around the politics of education because there's a lot of change uh, with the new uh, federal administration, state administrations, uh, the local politics. Uh, and, you know, I, I see on Facebook and on Twitter and among friends, everybody seems to be really concerned about it. So let's get a conversation going and let's see if we can put our heads together and figure out what we should be doing. In the meantime, uh, before I introduce uh, Jeff and Dave, I, um, I'm going to do my usual introduction to EdChat Interactive and Shindig. Uh, we created EdChat Interactive, that's uh, Tom Whitby, Steve Anderson, and me. Um, in order to provide a forum for educators to share best practices, and we wanted to do that in a way that was a lot more interactive than a typical webinar. So we found the Shindig platform, who have generously allowed us to, to use the platform for these, and that allows us to conduct these sessions in a manner that's much more analogous to the way adults learn, or as Tom likes to call it, andragogy. And, um, you know, and I'll be talking about those features uh, right now. The first two features are the raise hand and the ask button. Uh, the raise hand button is something that allows me to see uh, who you are. So th there's going to be times during the, the session where we post a question and we say, if you'd like to talk about this question, please raise your hand. Uh, what we don't mean is to raise your hand like this. What we mean is for you to click on the raise hand button, and that me that tells me that you'd like to come up and talk to our guests. So, uh, so the first way of interacting is clicking on the raise hand button. The second way of interacting is, is interacting is clicking on the ask button. Uh, if you have a question and you'd like the question to go to me, <clears throat> sorry, then you'll click on the ask button. I'll see the question, and then I can direct it to Jeff and Dave. Um, it, or if it's a technical question, I can answer it myself. So uh, there's the raise hand, there's the ask button, and then there's texting or back channel. If you move your cursor over your avatar, you notice that there's a five icon menu. One of those icons is IM. If you uh, click on IM, well, I'd like you to click on IM, and that's going to open up a window. And that'll give you the chance to interact with the, with the other people here through texting. So I'd like you to introduce yourself, uh, open up that IM window, type in where you're from, and um, maybe type in a question. Now I see actually somebody has typed in a question here. Um, uh, Tom Whitby's camera is not working. Um, so Tom, fix it. Uh, or call technical support. Uh, see if Joyce is there. Um, when I come down, I'll um, I'll connect with you and see if we can try something. But in the meantime, Tom, why don't you try and doing a refresh uh, so that, you know, and see if that works? Uh, so uh, so we've had our first person do, uh, use the uh, question. Um, and, you know, if you're here, I'd like you to use the IM and introduce yourself. Maybe go over with something that you'd like to uh, to ask today or or to learn about. And then the uh, the fourth way of interacting is through video chatting. And uh, if there's a lot of people here and we pose a question, you can actually break into small groups and you can discuss that question within small groups by clicking on somebody else's avatar. Uh, I think tonight uh, I'm going to skip the exercise now. Normally we have you click on the other person, another person, and discuss what you want to learn tonight. Um, but I think I'll, I'll move on because we're, we're going to be doing that probably during the session. And I'll just talk about what we have coming up. Um, our next uh, regular Edge, Edge Chat Interactive is going to be on uh, something called Eurythmics, which is using sound, motion, and music. And uh, Patrick uh, Surya has developed a whole curriculum around using Eurythmics, and it reaches, uh, it reaches kids in the autism spectrum, it reaches kids who are gifted, it reaches kids who are special education. Um, it's been really interesting. So he's going to talk about techniques that you can use using uh, sound, music, and motion uh, to engage all kids in your classes. And we, 
before that, we're hoping to start our first micro course on EdChat Interactive. It's going to be on, on playful learning. And uh, we're just putting the final touches around it over the course of the next week. And, with, and then um, we're hoping to start it uh, the evening of April 17th. So that's what's coming up on EdChat Interactive. We have more events coming up, which we'll be adding to the schedule over the next couple of weeks. And without further ado, I'd like to bring up our two ed, ed tech guys from Arkansas who are having fun. <laughs> Aha, I hear fun. Ah, there we go. That's all right. We're having fun. <laughs> Absolutely. We Thank are you. having a good time, and we're really glad to be here. Yeah. Thank you very much for uh, having us on. And uh, hopefully, uh, hello to everybody out there, and uh, hopefully, uh, everybody will walk away knowing some, some more, or at least uh, thinking about some of the things about politics and education. I am Dave. I'm David Henderson. And I'm Jeff Madlock. And uh, welcome to the show. Uh, we're, we're the Edutech guys. Oh, yeah. I forgot. Okay. I was so to just, yeah, why don't you tell people a little bit about Edutech? You, you have a series of interviews that, that you run, correct? And a website and a blog. That's correct. I'll give you a quick rundown. Um, two years ago, uh, Dave and I were having lunch one day. We both had done some radio in our time. And we said, you know, we should do a podcast. And the next day, we podcasted an entire event for Corwin. <laughs> two days. Wow. So 16 hours of live. And we found out that we're not too bad at it. We do like to talk and we like to interview people and hear their stories. So that worked out really well. Um, we started then doing a weekly live show at 4 o'clock Central Time every Wednesday. Uh, there was one today. Yep. And um, we've done a show every Wednesday for almost two years now. Um, we also wow. got into uh, going to conferences, um, AESA, the Hot Springs Technology Conference, uh, FETSI, mm -hmm. and we like to set up and do live broadcasting from those conferences so that educators and entrepreneurs and companies, services can sit down and tell us about them and tell us about their journey in this great big ed tech universe. Yeah, and so uh, you can find us at uh, EduTech Guys on Twitter, that's just at EduTech Guys. Uh, edutechguys.com, Facebook, you name it. Basically, like we, we like to say, if you will Google edutechguys, all one word, that's us. You'll find it. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, so I'm going to bring up your slides and your, and your questions. And I guess the way it will work is the question will come up um, on, this, on the slide. You'll uh, talk to each other a little bit about the question. And then you'll ask if anybody wants to talk about this or has questions about it um, or a point of view. And if they want to, then raise their hand, um, and then I'll bring them up. It, it, for those of you, if any of you don't have a webcam, but you do want to answer the question, if you click on the, the Ask button, then I'll get the question, and I can raise it. Or if you open up your IM window, which you can do by uh, arrowing over your avatar and, and clicking on IM, then you can type it in yourself. Um, I will say that of all the people here, there's one person tonight who cannot see what, what you type in in the IM box, and that's me. Um, so, uh, so, but, um, you know, Jeff and Dave can see it, and they're the most important ones. Um, and I'll pull myself down um, and pull your slides up. Cool. <clears throat> this first slide, uh, when it comes up here, We'll give it just a second. Great. Uh, it's really not a question. It's just a great starting point for us to look at. Um, the politics of education, we can look back all the way back to why we started education in this country to fill the factories of workers. <laughs> I won't go there. Stealing that from a TEDx talk. But you know, it's really interesting. The politics of education, to me, really in the federal involvement, came about in 1965 when uh, President Lyndon B. Johnson pushed through on his warfare on poverty, uh, the 1965, the Primary and Secondary Education Act. Now, what's interesting, just a little overview of that, um, pretty much everything that's happened since that, No Child Left Behind, the new ESSA that's out there now, every student has success act, all that good stuff, is nothing but a reauthorization of that act in 1965. Now, they add stuff to it, right? That's what say. Right. <laughs> like in 2002 in No Child Left Behind, they decided to throw in uh, what grades would then test and be assessed, and we've moved on and moved on. In fact, that's pretty much what's happened. Now, to, to us, 
one of the sad parts about this is, is that it's now been 52 years and we're still, we're still in our warfare on poverty in education. Mm -hmm. So that first slide was just to kind of get it going and to see if anybody had also a take on, you know, where we've been over the last 50 years. Right. And it's, it's been a, an interesting road and where you think actually the politics of edu education got to the local environment. I mean, when we think back about it, we were handling most of the politics locally. Our school boards were local. They hired their own superintendents. They hired their own teachers. You know, churches and local government had most of the control of, you know, what was happening in right. public education. And it's interesting to think about when that changed. Where was that, where was that screen door that flew open and the federal government came even more emblazoned inside politics. So if anybody has anything on that, we'll give you an opportunity to raise your hand and maybe throw something at So, I mean, I'll, I'll throw in a little bit because, um, you know, part of this is that the federal government is really only 9% of the education budget. So really the other 90% comes from a combination of state and local and every state is different like in in new york it's um i think uh 30 percent state uh 60 percent local uh but in something like california i think it's much more state oriented so um so in a certain sense the federal government you know has less inter influence than one would think um because you know the funding really comes at the state level on the other hand Every school district in every state relies on that budget, uh, relies on that nine or ten percent, and that's what they use very often to buy materials from. Uh, so uh, when, the, when the federal government sends, sets policy and says that you have to do so and so, um, that has ramifications throughout the whole schools. And I think that the first time that that really became a huge issue was under uh, President Bush, which, which was a joint program um, modifying the, um, ed, you know, the, the Elementary and Secondary School Education Act uh, called NCLB, No Child Left Behind. And that was the first time that there, was, that there were much more formal rules around what you could do with federal money and what, what you had to do. Um, so uh, so I think you know that was a that was a big change um, in the past. Uh, I think that our whole emphasis was if we required teachers to go through some training programs before they became teachers. So if we we focused on the inputs to school, and that was the first time that we focused on the outputs, which was test scores and whether or not those were the right things, to, whether those were the right outputs to test on. Or whether the tests were good, or, or you know, there's a whole lot of issues there. But this was an experiment to see if we could finally do something to close the gap between the poor schools, or the poorly performing schools, and the better performing schools. Right, I agree. And it's funny that it was it was that it was W at that time that also started the first hint of well, it wasn't the first hint, but he really got behind the voucher idea, and you know therefore pushing states and local government to change their policies based on a federal decision. That was very interesting. And, and now we're seeing that resurgence here in our politics of today. We're starting to see that come back as the Republican agenda is probably pushed forward a little bit. Well, and I think it's important also that even though in the scheme of things, yeah, sure, okay, the federal, the federal uh, education money is 9 to 10% nine to of the budget, you know, you can take that all the way down to your home level. How, how, how easy or difficult or how much would your life change if you lost nine to ten percent of your budget at your house? Yeah. You know, and you then you think, you know, it, it, on one hand, you think, well, it's only nine percent or it's only ten percent. Yeah. Until it hits home, and you kind of go, well, yeah, I couldn't go ten percent less, or I couldn't do this, and maybe you can, but. I think that's a, I think that's a, also something to consider, but and, and also how much money you're talking about. And, and I know in the scheme of things, nine to ten percent is still nine to ten percent, but it's still you know, 
a lot of money that we're talking about. And obviously, it matters a whole lot because you see things where uh, you know there are definitely, obviously, states who they bend over backwards to get that nine to ten percent money. You know, right. part of me says, you know, look, it's nine to ten percent. Yeah, it's a chunk of money, but you know, in the scheme of things, why are you going through all of these hoops? Why are you jumping through all this stuff to get this money when you could just tell them, you know what, keep your ten percent. We're going to do things our way. But they don't, that. and we're, know, we're starting to see that. But you know, a lot of them don't. They you know, will, they will do what it takes to get that quote unquote free money. And one of the questions that came in on the registration, and I'm going down another rabbit hole here, was um, just concerning autism. And you, you would think, oh, what does that have to do with the politics? Well, let's get into special services. Mm -hmm. Let's get into the because we're talking small percentages. When we start to take a chunk of money and putting into the military, and we start cutting it from those other areas. Which areas are going to get cut first? Right. Now, and that's going to leak all the way into state funding and local funding. It's going to work its way down. And just like Mitch had said, a lot of schools use that federal money. I mean, my school does. The one-to-one -one initiative at, at, at our school district was funded by federal money. And so in this technological age, we could see ourselves hit very hard when that 10% is gone because we were using that money to pay for the technology that we did to keep the kids moving. Right. Forward. And 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 it's interesting because, well, I mean, so much of it is interesting. Before I go on, uh, Tom Whitby doesn't ha seem to have video, but I'd like, like he has his hand raised. So we're going to do an experiment. I'm going to bring him up and let's see if you can hear him, if he can ask okay. a question. If that doesn't work, then I'll bring him back down and, and, and uh, you know, I'll come back up. But let's see if this works. Yeah, yeah sure. Tom. Boy, I'm hey, to look better. Hi, guys. Hey. hey. Hi. Um, you know, talking about all of this national stuff is good, but um, again, we have to keep in mind all politics is local. And, and one of the biggest problems teachers have is uh, dealing with the politics of their own school district. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think one of the reasons why uh, tenure came about was to to more or less insulate the teacher from local politics, and and there are you know so many places where tenure is not allowed; it's against the law. Uh, where do we stand with with dealing with that kind of a situation for teachers? I'll take that one. That's a great observation. In fact, it gets right into one of our next slides. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you're exactly right. Here in Arkansas, something that the legislature is looking at is getting rid of teacher fair dismissal. So, yes, some states already do not have teacher fair dismissal. And then we're looking at the, the, the sheer fact of that we're seeing a lot of privatized education take over. And privatized education means complete loss of tenure because pack your stuff up. I'm putting another person in your classroom tomorrow and you're without a job. And, and I think that that's what's interesting is when I guess we brought up the federal part because where has it where does when the local government, the local community and the local school districts start to make their plans, where do they take all of that into account and where do they take into account the economics of what's happening with our staff and, and how it's going to benefit our staff and not benefit our staff? Yes, it's about the children, but it's also tremendously about the staff. So. You know, we're seeing that even heavier here in Arkansas, and it scares us to death because um, just this week, uh, Bill 1222 in the Arkansas legislature is going to give a tax credit to families who want to homeschool their children or put their children in high school. So you see now we're going to create two different school systems in Arkansas. One, and, and now suddenly teacher fair dismissal disappears, privatization takes over, and we find ourselves in a big huge heap of mess here in Arkansas. Now, the other states, I unfortunately keep up with it as best I can, but the key here is, is that I think in weaning ourselves from federal money is the first step in taking back over our local government and our local schools, is by weaning ourselves as much as we can from federal bonds. That's just my take on the whole thing. David? He had his look on his face like he was going to uh, say I was, something. I, well, I was waiting. I didn't know if Tom was going to respond or yeah. I was waiting to see if Tom was going to want to say I, so, um, so if Tom, if you want to respond, uh, raise your hand. Or if somebody else wants to come up and, and discuss, you know, raise your 
raise your hand also. I, I have, um, just, you know, just, this, as matter, just just as a matter of um, my my viewpoint uh, on on some of, it, especially when you start to talk um, tenure, uh, I don't believe, at least from my recollection, I don't believe I've lived anywhere where there was tenure. So um, I have, I, I come from a different perspective um, and, I, and I understand some of the politics involved, but as Jeff mentioned, you know, at least here in Arkansas, um, you know, yes, we have teacher for dismissal, but by the same token, um, if certain things come into play, and sure, part of it is politics, um, but if certain things come into play, then there may have to be, uh, and as unfortunate as it is, there may have to be some, you know, reductions in force that, you know, sorry, you're just not teaching in this district anymore. And I think, um, I, I don't know, like I said, I have a, a little perspective um, on how some of that plays out. And, and I'm definitely open-minded enough to have someone, you know, visit, you know, at another time offline somewhere about how tenure works and all that. But I mean, I know how kind of how it works, but. Um, so so let me, uh, let me give a, 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 um, a counter argument, not, uh, you know, I'm, um, you know, so I'm not reflecting my own opinion here, and I'm not going to say what my opinion is, but, um, you know, in many districts, New York does have a tenure law, and in many districts, there are teachers who uh, have been teaching for years and years, I shouldn't say, but some teachers, um, who sure. the schools are not firing um, for because you know they claim it's because the teachers have tenure and um, you know and these teachers are actually harming the students by not really teaching them I uh, my kids both had a chemistry teacher who had been with the district for 20 years and I remember walking in on parents night for that for that for that teacher, and the teacher says good news they've uh, they've lowered the requirements on the uh, on the chemistry exam for the regions uh, which is our state test. Um, so uh, we don't have to teach as much this year as we've taught in previous years. And like, I went to the principal, I was like, this is not, this is not good news. I'm sorry. We should be teaching more. We shouldn't be celebrating teaching less. And the teacher says, yes, I know. There's nothing I can do about it. The, the principal said that. So, so on, on, on the one hand, you know, um, tenure was created so that teachers had a fair, could weather um, you know, changes in local administrations. But on the other hand, um, districts have been using that or, or and administ uh, uh, administrators, principals, have been using that a a as a way to keep teachers who are not doing their jobs. And in New York, in New York City, I mean, there were something like, like 1,300 teachers I, and I could the number I could be really wrong. So, but that that's a number that kind of sticks in my head. But a lot of teachers who were just shelved, who went, were paid to walk to empty classrooms every day because they didn't want those teachers in front of students, and they didn't want to take the the effort. And I th yeah, think it's yeah, stories of like that. So, what are you, you know? What are your thoughts? And uh, somebody has raised their hand. It's probably it's probably Tom, who probably. Yeah, 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 uh, I'm yeah. glad I'm not in the same room with Tom as I'm saying this because he would probably um, clobber me for saying it. But what are your thoughts? And then I'll bring myself down and I'll bring Tom back up. Okay. No, my. So, what are your is, thoughts I, on that? I. I it's it's interesting because this all comes back to. You know, we, we have the same problem, and that's where teacher fair dismissal comes into play. Because as an administrator, on one hand, you need that teacher fair dismissal. You need the, the absence of tenure to fix that problem. But at the same time, it doesn't. One of our slides actually said, the war on poverty has driven federal government's involvement in education. Has it been a driving factor in the classroom? Now, we all know that this comes down to money, and this all comes down to your pay to play. And you play to pay. And that's what this comes down to. And it comes down to the, the red hot shit. What am I getting? What am I paying for? And this is where the assessment piece is moving. This is where we are with data driven, you know, decision making. And are, is the teacher really teaching? Should we pay them more money? It's not, are they worth it? It's, it's my grandfather used to say, if someone makes $100,000 at a factory or at, at, at a job, 
then they need to be bringing in a minimum of $300,000. They have to be worth us paying them that much money to come in. And, and so that's the way that the majority of the politicians down to the local end see what, what bang am I getting from my buck here? And the parents see it probably the same way because, well, that's the way politics works. But it, it's that pay to play. And, and I think that that's where we're sitting with it. I think that's why we're seeing them try to continue. And I see that's why we're being pushed by, you do well in the assessments, we'll give you more money. I mean, that's, I, I hope I'm hitting that in the ballpark. Okay, so Tom is, is up. Uh, go ahead and then. You're back on stage, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I you know I don't want to hijack this whole thing with a discussion of tenure, but there there are, are a few things that we that we really have to talk about because it is uh, local politics that actually forced that to happen because um, people taking a political stand could be fired for for no reason whatsoever. For instance, you know in in today's setting, if um, um, we're we're talking about uh, our biology class, uh, we're not going to be teaching, you know we're we're going to be teaching evolution one would assume, since that is what, what that science is based on. And if someone takes a stand to teach evolution, and, and that is not something that the school board wants to have taught, um, that teacher could lose their job. So, you know, that, that's one setting where politics enters into it. But tenure itself is just the due process in, in, in the ability to fire a teacher, giving that teacher due process, you know, in, in the entire procedure. The problem comes in where um, many of the administrators do not follow the rules of due process. They drop the ball. And it's not always their fault because, you know, in education, administrators change over probably every three years on average. And that, mm -hmm. that may not be a time enough for them to establish themselves as, as people who can even evaluate all of the teachers in their staff. So they move on, and then the next administrator moves in and has to start from scratch. So, so there sure. are reasons why teachers fall through the cracks. But, but the larger reason for it is, is many administrators not doing the job of the administrator to, to um, you know, dot the, cross the T's and dot the I's on these procedures that they bring against these teachers, which makes it much harder over the long term since the previous administration didn't do it, this administration didn't do it, then the third administrator comes up and, and he's faced with all these problems. And it's much more difficult to establish uh, a case against a teacher for whatever reason if no one else established that case at that time. So right. you know, that, well, that's, just, that's just my thing. And, and th there are more reasons than that, but, but tenure is probably one of the most misunderstood things that we have in education, and, and people are fighting it all the way and, and trying to get rid of it, which demoralizes teachers. Sure, sure. Well, and, and I think I think ultimately um, the point you bring up about uh, politically motivated uh, boards and, and what you can teach, what you can't teach, uh, I, I think that applies to, especially in this day and age of everybody's got to be politically correct and you can't hurt everybody's feelings by actually speaking. Um, by the way, any opinions expressed on this show, whether they are, are our real or yeah, these are all personal <laughs> opinions or whatever. So anyway, anyway, I'm in the same boat in terms of um, you know there are certain things that I I am not allowed to um, basically uh, preach or talk about talk against think about um, because of you know because of the organization where I work and, and those are some of the things you have to take into account and, and it's not necessarily fair okay but by the same token when you go to work for a particular organization that's you know as long as that's in policy somewhere then that's policy and so it, it takes the it takes that teacher a group of teachers whoever it takes to work with the policy makers at that local district to affect that change. So I know it's, it's, it's ugly and it can be brutal, um, but from my perspective anyway, that change has to come from the folks who can change that local policy. So I hope, that, hope that's 
No, I don't know if it's a good explanation, but that's anyway from my perspective. That's the way I see it. Well, I mean, you know, it, and it's a very slippery road. It's a it's it's a very hard thing to uh, to to draw lines in the sand when it comes to those kinds of things. Um, and frankly, you're going to have teachers who are going to teach it anyway. And guess what? They are going to lose their job. And depending on who they are, they may raise the biggest ruckus and. In you know today's day and age of social media, social media gets behind them, and they end up finding a job somewhere else, or even back in the district where they were before. But that's where that change has to come from. It's got to be, at least from my perspective, that change has to come from within policy. And I'm, I'm well. And I, I, one on last thing, we'll wrap up this topic and move on to another slide in the topic. But this is, for me, the, the problem is, is that it, it is so different across the country, from state to state, from local school district to local school district. It's so different that it cannot get any support steam behind it in either direction because it's just so different everywhere. Mm -hmm. and, and see, that gets us into that big government thing. Well, let's make one decision. Everybody's going to think it's like cookie cutter mold. Mm -hmm. and, and we can't do that. We all know that that's not the answer to it. But you see, that's that's the beauty. Well, that's the beauty of democracy. And that's <laughs> that's just pretty much what it comes down to. Oh, or, now, or, or the or the ugly of uh, democracy. I think it's beauty, by the way. Oh, well, but that's that's potato potato. So, <laughs> but all right. The one thing that was sent to us, we had some great some great suggestions. Were um, we had a lot of questions in the the registration area um, about you know what autism was one and one was about one to one, and it comes down to the politics of funding, the politics of curriculum. We could, like I said to David, we could this this could be a four hour show in a nineteen part series, part one. Yeah. You know, and we could continue having this discussion every week constantly. But let's talk about right now. Let's talk about fake news. Let's talk about the current political climate and what we're going to have to deal with because it's being shoved in our face and they're expecting the schools to handle this. One of them is fake news. I'm going to be honest with you. I've noticed fake news my whole life. Right. So that's kind of a, and, and it scares National me to think. National Enquirer has been around for a long time. Well, but it, it scares me to think that we have a, a large contingency of our population that doesn't understand uh, fake news. And, right. and, and they, they don't see it for themselves. But this brings us to how do we start to teach our students? This is a lot like teaching them a growth mindset over a fixed mindset. How do we start teaching our students to observe it, ingest it, and spit out what they don't need and, and get what they need to, and, and then search for the right truth. That's that's a great question. I see Mitch, Mitch do you have something on that? Well, so the, number one, I was going to say, if you would like to participate in the discussion about fake news, um, either raise your hand and we'll bring you up to uh, to either ask questions or, or tell what you're doing or, or, or join the discussion, or you can click on that IM window and you can type it in. Um, and uh, Jeff and David can can address it that way, or click on the ask question, in which case it will come to me and, and I'll raise it. But the whole purpose of this is to get a dialogue going, um, or, or a multi-log going, I should say, <laughs> or whatever it is between multiple people to talk about a lot of these issues. One of the, just so, since I'm up here anyhow, so one of the interesting things about fake news that I, I was just, um, uh, I get a, a security, a uh, cybersecurity email. Um, I'm on one of the listservs or something, and the one that came yesterday was about the um, fake Twitter. You know, Twitter bots, and there's a there's Twitter bots, and they uh, according to this, they trace them um, to organizations that are tied to Breitbart. Um, I have no, I don't know if that's true or not. So I'm just you know I want to raise it. I don't know if they're really from Breitbart, but they said that, um, I guess, yesterday or the day before yesterday, those bots tweeted um, something like 300,000 tweets mm -hmm. about how it wasn't the Russians who were monitoring, who were, um, uh, um, who were interfering with the election. It was the FBI and the CIA. And so, you know, like the power of being able to, well, tweet out on Twitter, but also, um, you know, t tweeting out and then having it link uh, stories um, that are kind of fake news stories that then get put up on Facebook that other that that people see. That type of power didn't exist even three years ago. 
it's just it's not something that's brand new. So Bradley, I just want to like raise that. I'd like to say I, I grew up on a farm outside of Hope, Arkansas, and I had uh, I had three channels. BBS right. was one of them. And if my parents didn't tell it to me, I didn't hear it at Sunday school or church, or a teacher didn't tell it to me, or I didn't see it on the NBC or ABC channel or PBS, then I didn't know about it. And I, you know, I didn't know what was real, what was fake. I just took in. And look where we are today. Instantaneously, you know, stories happen. They blow up within a matter of milliseconds. And our kids, the, the, uh, Barbara had a great point. She said she has students in her classroom right now that um, she, I am does. She, she has students in her classroom right now who have a real hard time of understanding what fake news is. But here's a great question. How do we define the real news for them in a classroom setting? How do we politically correctly in our school district with probably no rules defining it, define what real news is to our students without catching a lot of blowback from the community or our administration, that, that gets us into a really thin ice area, in my opinion. Well, and, and well, that's why you get paid the big bucks, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and, and you know, and, and also, it wasn't all that long ago when there were reputable news sources who were, for the most part, um, yeah. <laughs> For the most part, though, at least from my perspective, anyway, we're generally unbiased. Um, you know, they delivered the news to you. Uh, and the that, barber shop is what it was. That, That's where you, <laughs> you know, that is, is right. right. It, you know, that has really, really, in the last few years, you know, like you said, you know, with with Twitter and Facebook and just the blow up of social media, different social media platforms in general. Um, you know, that has really, really gone by the wayside. You know, it used to be we could we could look for the sources, you know, look at the source, where did it come from, and then can you compare that to other sources that have said the same thing. And in the past, that's how you basically could, could kind of, you know, separate the wheat from the chaff. And these days, mm -hmm. you know, as you're trying to do follow-up, the problem you run into is if something is juicy, then it's getting retweeted and, and reposted and shared and blasted all over the place. So you really can't separate. You know, you can't find that needle in, the, in, the, in a haystack. You're looking for a needle in a stack of needles. I mean, it's <laughs> ridiculous. Well, I'm going to you know, steal that from you. I actually stole that's a quote from a movie. Too. Well, you know, let's, 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 we can get stuck on this. Fake news. Uh, anybody out there have anything else they want to add about fake news? Anybody? I, I don't see anything in, in the, uh, the yeah, slides here. In. Yeah, or or rate or click on the raise hand if you want if you have uh, something Barbara, you want to talk we, about on Barbara fake news. Response. She said, "I bring in articles from both sides of any issue that they bring up, and I think that's a great idea. Um, you know, the best thing we can do is bring in the information and let them to start com comparing it themselves." And a lot of us have always just done that on the fly. We, we've actually taken it for what it worth. But if I had a dollar for every time one of my teachers writes me and asks me if that they need to send money to the Nigerian prince, that's gonna, they're going to be millionaires, then I would not have to work in education anymore because people still, right. fake news is fake news. And sometimes it's so juicy, you want it to be true. Right. You know, and that's, that's, that's that American dream. And we'll call it. Let's jump on in the, in the slide. Oh, so the next thing. I'm had an interesting question for you guys. Okay. okay. Um, it's it's too hard a question for me to answer, so I'm going to parrot it back for you guys. You know, if adults, including teachers, cannot discern fake news from real, what hope is there for kids? The, the, well, and I'll be honest with you, none. I, it, it, and there's the interesting thing is with the breakdown of parental units, as everyone likes to say, I, you know, if you're going home to an adult who doesn't know how to discern between fake and real news, and you're going to, to and the sage on the stage doesn't know how to either, either, uh, then we're finding ourselves, I, I can't give an answer to that one. In fact, uh, Nathan Nims wrote, in, in the current digital age, what's the best way to enable teachers to help kids understand fake news, but there's the thing is that we're asking teachers to be the ones that are the, the litmus test for fake news, and and how well, do we do that? Uh, here's here's kind of my thought on this. Um, I actually have a, a journalism background, so um, you know, way back in the day, there was this thing uh, 
that was not politically correctly called yellow journalism. <laughs> And frankly, that's a fact where we've returned to the to the age of you know throwing anything out there and see what sticks and what's hot and, and what trends and all the other hoo ha. And so I really think that just like in those days when there was this huge backlash against uh, that mentality, I, I I truly believe, especially today's kids. Today's kids are they really are amazing, um, especially if they find a cause they get behind. You know, a lot of people want to dismiss today's kids. Yeah, our kids, yeah, you've got, you know, but every generation has the kids that are, you know, out there, you know, kind of going not again, not just against the grain, but against everything. Um, mm -hmm. But you have, you know, I, I think you have these children, these students who are going to eventually come together and stand up and say, we're not putting up with this fake news junk anymore. This is ridiculous. You know, you're either going to provide reputable sources or we're just not going to follow you, read you, retweet you, uh, you know, friend you, you know, like your page, all that kind of stuff. So there is a lot of power. It just hasn't, the students haven't got to that point yet. So I actually think there is hope. It's just when and, and you know, how long is it going to take to get there? I agree with so, David. And, and, that, and these snowflakes are not snowflakes. <coughs> I, 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 yes, you can get angry at them, and yes, we could say some things about that, but they're just trying to sift through the BS, and, and the only way they know how to do it at this point is to get out there and let their voice be heard. You know, the number one thing that uh, when, when voting was not allowed for slavery, the biggest thing was show up. Show up. We're going to show up every time at the poll, and, and I believe that's what we're seeing here. They're not calling it that, but they're showing up. And they're demanding to know the truth. They're demanding to find out. And so even if taking some fake news, as the new man would like to say, well, that's fake news. They're, they're pro protesting over fake news. Well, at least they're protesting to try to find out. Then tell us the real news. Right. And what is the real Tell news? us the real stuff. We're here. And yeah. So we so, yeah. So we I would like to say, if, if there's a way that we can get kids to what I call go meta, to think about it, not just what was said, but to think about it broader, like is this, is, is what I just read or heard, is it fact, conjecture, opinion, hypothesis, or theory? And if, they, if, he, if we can get them to understand that when things are said, they're one of those five things, then at least they're critically thinking about it. And you know, there's very few things that are really facts, okay? The, you know, it's it's a fact that I'm 35 years old. Well, that's a fake right. fact. Uh, but well. it's, I mean, it's a fact that I'm, <laughs> it's, a, it's a fact, you know, my my age is a fact, okay? The, the fact that I said my age is a fact is a fact. But when I say that, um, I don't know, the, the Democrats are out to ruin public ed education, that's not a fact, okay? It may be a conjecture, it may be an opinion, it may be a hypothesis, or it may be a theory. But if I, you can think about it, you know, like the weakest of those is a conjecture. Okay, something that somebody is just raising that you know uh, may or may not have any basis of, of logic. Um, an opinion is kind of an, you know it's it's kind of um, it's it's often more emotional. Um, a hypothesis is something that hey, you know something I I'd like to test this out and a theory is something I mean that's the highest you can get that people have been trying to disprove it and nobody's been able to disprove it so you know if we can get kids to start thinking in those terms fact conjecture opinion hypothesis and theory then I think that we've done a great service to them to get them to think about and and digest and understand what's fake news um, and what's uh, what they can really latch on to Yes, well, and, and you brought up um, you brought up a, a, a very good point, and, and Catherine, right at the same time you started talking about exactly. it, she also uh, brought up uh, the same thing and said, you know, basically, they they have not gotten fed up uh, as much as we have yet, and so we need to hammer critical thinking skills in order for them to discern between fake news and real news. So that's a big part of it. And which that's been a conversation of 21st century learners for a long time, right? Critical thinking. So um, let's let's move on. So um, that, and, that moves us into a great area, I think, because let's I'm gonna jump I'm gonna jump past vouchers. Let's not even talk about vouchers. That's 
but data-driven decisions and the assessment dilemma. So in this, just as Mitch was talking about, you know, making data-driven decisions, you know, I, I hate the lingo that's out there right now. It just, it burns me. I want to jump into the assessment dilemma, though, because this is a big one. Um, critical thinking skills. The assessments do not know. Useless. The assessments drop us right back to, we're going to teach you to take orders, and we're going to teach you to fall in line and get in the factory and make pencils all day long. And, and that's not where we need to go. Uh, the, I was lucky enough to study music under the composer Francis W. Macbeth, and he used to tell the freshmen as he brought them in, listen, kids, everybody's not going to be a famous composer. When I go to get a hamburger or I need my toilet fixed, I'm going to need somebody to flip the patties and somebody to be my plumber. And that's, that's okay. My father owns a body shop. He started working at 17. He put us all through college. No said. He is the backbone of the infrastructure of my small family. So that's where we need to be looking at. It's not just about technology. It's not just about one-to-one. -one. It's about critical thinking skills. It's about project-based learning. It's about maker spaces. It's about letting these kids dream and imagine again and building a space to live in the 21st century. This is not 1965, and the war on poverty is completely different. So the assessment dilemma. You know how I feel about it. I would think David might feel well, the same way, maybe. <laughs> well, a little. Um, my, my biggest issue with assessments, and especially when we're talking about politics and tying it into that federal money, um, the issue becomes that that's what, it, that's what it's all about, the assessment. Because I need to know what the score is in order to say, yes, you get money, or no, you don't get money. Um, and, and holding the schools accountable in order to get the money. I, my personal opinion is, look, if there's federal money to be given out to the schools, then just freaking give it to the schools. You know, what is up with all of this? I just don't. Uh, now, I, and, and I will say that I actually, I think that the, um, the, the thing about assessments, sorry, I, my brain fried there for a minute. Um, I believe that if assessments are done correctly, then it gives the people involved, i.e. teachers and, and helping their students, it gives them the information they need to be able to help those students. It's, again, my opinion, it's ridiculous in, in my brain that we give an assessment to this particular fourth grade class. And then we give an assessment, the same assessment or slightly different assessment, whatever, to the next fourth grade class. And then that's what things are based on. You have two completely different groups of students. From my opinion, there would be an assessment at the beginning of the year and an assessment at the end of the year using the same students. And then you figure out, was there growth? Was there not growth? which students grew, which ones did not, and then throughout the year you can, if you need to, do some, some very quick minor interim assessments that help the teacher understand where those students are and what they need. I know you skipped over data-driven decisions, and I'm going Go to jump, jump back to that because I am step a huge here. proponent of data-driven decisions when it's used correctly, and this ties into the assessment piece. If the teachers know how to use that data and that they do use that data to help their students, I'm all for it. Absolutely. Uh, my wife uh, used to teach second grade. Now she's a literacy um, facilitator. That's not the right word for it, but I can't think off the top of my head what it is. Um, and she uses data all the time to help those students that need the help in order to help them progress in their literacy and their reading. So I know we're kind of, you know, just kind of spewing forth words. So as we've been talking, definitely, you know, if you've got an opinion, you want to say something, raise your hand, ask the question. I do want to say um, that we did have a couple of things in here, and I'm trying to see if I can pull these up. Uh, sorry, I could help. Uh, that was well. That was back for. That was back with the other. Uh, Tom. Tom had posted something really great here. I was trying to find that. There it is, right there. Um, so Tom had posted this. A reason there are so many political blocks in education is that our common experience of education leads everyone to think they have the answer. Mm -hmm. And that's right. And, you know, isn't that funny? That's where fake news came from. I mean, it really did. Is because you get all the pundits on television and on the Internet and on the radio yeah. who 
they have a common interest in politics and their opinion now becomes law because yeah. we all think we have the answer and uh, we don't. That's kind of interesting. Uh, Tom, thanks for putting that out there. Mitch is, Mitch Mitch is coming, coming back, back in. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to weigh in a little bit on assessment also and I still would, would like to encourage everybody you know, to, uh, to, you know, IM responses to click on the ask button, in which case I'll pass your question along or to raise your hand, in which case you can come up here and, and, and discuss. But so my original background, my original, original background was in systems. And then my, my next background was really in corporate training for, for a number of years. And we, and I did a lot of studies and, and read a lot of studies. Um, and when we talked about assessments that could be scaled, we really talked about assessing on four different levels okay so at one level you're assessing you can assess feelings you know what did you think about this how, how did you feel like you learned it okay uh, in corporate training we used to call those smile sheets okay and um those aren't particularly valuable but they're you know they're not terrible and they are something okay and the next level is facts okay you can ask facts about what the person learned okay so um, you know, what was the date that the uh, the Constitution was ratified? When was the Declaration of Independence? What's in the First Amendment? You know, those are those are re uh, recalling of facts. Now, the um, that's somewhat valuable. You can see if somebody knows something, and you could do a, a, a fact test before and a fact test afterwards, so you could test the the, the movement involved. But we. Our rule of thumb was that if you wanted to do assessment about facts, it basically cost about 5% of what you were spending on total instruction. So it wasn't, it was, it was a really low cost. It wasn't nothing. Okay. But you could do that relatively easy. But again, that's not what you really wanted to know. You know, it, we, we want to know, are they doing critical thinking? Are they coming up with new solutions? Are they able to work together? Are they able to take a problem, figure out what the math is involved, and solve the math? That's what we really want to know. That's behavior. Are they changing their behavior? That's a lot harder to measure. And our rule of thumb was that if you want to measure behavior, you have to take about 25% of your instructional budget and put it towards measuring behavior. That's a, that's a big chunk. Now, you know, and then the final thing is results. Okay, results not only are is expensive to measure results, but it takes time because what we really want to know is, and and with kids is, are they growing up to be responsible adults? Okay, so what we're doing in third grade is that making them better able to handle middle school? What we're doing in middle school is that better able? Are they better able to handle high school? What we're doing in high school are they becoming better adults or better able to 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 do? college level work and that's both expensive and takes a lot of time um, you know every time the decision came do we put 25 percent of measuring or do we put more F or we, do we reduce it down to five percent so we have 20 percent more to put into instruction the decision always comes back to you know something let's measure something so we could put more money into into instruction but then we can't. We shouldn't really be relying on these assessments to really determine whether the kid advances in grades, whether the teacher's a good teacher, whether the school's a good school. Okay, they're they're poor substitutes for what we really want to get. So um, that's my soapbox. Um, and uh, Tom, uh, you know, t Tom is an interesting thing. So he said, you know, re recall. You know, which is true, recall is on the lowest part of knowledge in the pyramid in, in Bloom's taxonomy, and yet that's what we're testing, we want. So what do you think about that? <laughs> right, right. Well, and I'd like to say, Barbara made a good point. She said, as a reading specialist, she's constantly using data to monitor her student progress and determine what they need to learn. See, there's, there's this beautiful part about exactly what you did. We've got to determine what they need to learn, and then we have to learn how to assess on that determination and now we've gotten into a really bad place of manpower because that takes a lot of time. Luckily, technology is starting to catch up with us and helping us do some of that. But the things that we're actually looking for, the things that you might always be looking for in any business situation cannot be done by a machine. It, it, it actually takes human interaction 
to, to, to define that quality and look for that, that perfect quality. If that was true, we would hire everyone today by just looking at the computer, reading the resume and matching it to key points and telling us this is the best score you should hire this person. And right. I, and so, I'll say, yeah. Go ahead. And I'll say, it can't be done by a machine, period. I will say, though, that games are an interesting idea because, uh, you know, and, and games is just, you know, educational games is just, is one of my passions. Uh, and because um, because if you look at at video games, even non education video games, people are learning while they're doing them. The game is assessing what the people are learning and feeding them the information, you know, feeding them challenges to get them on to the next level. Uh, now, it is incredibly expensive to make games that hold people's interest and do the assessing over long periods of time. You know, these professional video games are, you know, they're, they're costing, you know, five, ten, twenty million dollars to, to develop and, and the, you know, the education mark for that. But I'm, but maybe that comes down at, at some point and I'd love to see more game-based learning used in education, but that's, that's the different topic. Let me get your slide back up to, uh, so you can, Talk to the, these well, points again. Well, say, you know, we're talking about all of the uh, assessment and, and, and what, what we like about assessments and what we don't like about assessments. But ultimately, for the top, for the, for the conversation of the, the hour, <clears throat> mm -hmm. you know, ultimately it gets back to the politics of the assessments. And right. And, and again, as I mentioned before, that's the problem I have with with tying assessments to the federal money. Like I said, from my opinion. If there's federal money, then and it's for the schools, then give it to the schools. I did want to mention real quickly, um, there is a Senate Joint Resolution currently out, uh, Senate Joint Resolution 25, um, and the author is um, uh, Mr. Alexander, and I apologize, I, I can't, that's all it says, and I, I used to know his first name, but I can't remember off the top of my head, but anyway, and essentially, uh, if I read it correctly, its purpose is to remove the um, validity of the state. Uh, well, it's it's well, it's the it's supposed to remove the accountability that the states are being held to in order to receive um, the money that is tied to the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, where we started all of this. You know, so that basically, if if I, again, if I'm reading this right, then it, it gets to that point of saying, look, there's federal money for the schools. We don't have to hold the schools accountable to get the money. Just give them the money. Uh, and I may be misinterpreting that. And if somebody else there has more information about this uh, SJ Res 25, by all means, feel free to share that. Uh, thank you, uh, Mitch uh, said that's Lamar Alexander. So thank you very much sure, for, uh, for helping me with that. I, I knew it at one point. Well, and, and that brings us into, we'll jump to our last one, federal, state, yeah. and local taxes. Um, like we told you here in Arkansas, the legislature is just possibly about to pass Act 1222, Bill 1220 which will give a, local, a state tax break credit to people who want to do homeschool their children and or send them to a private school. And uh, that's, there's some other things tagged on to it. Uh, I personally believe it's a, a, a voucher and a tax credit clothing is what it is, and, and eventually moving into that. And in this current political climate, I believe the feds are going to put a lot of pressure um, uh, the new president is very business minded and so I can see the uh, president putting a lot of pressure to make the federal government uh, even a little heavy handed inside what's happening in local in state and local taxation mm -hmm. so as to provide uh, big business the opportunity to get its its claws into education with privatized schools. Well, and Tom, so Tom, your Tom wants to chime in so uh, you're, you're, you're back up again. Yeah, well, I, you know, it, it's, I know it's getting toward the, the end of the time that we have together, but, uh, you know, a couple of things I wanted to say. Number one, you know, I do believe that um, there is an effort on the part of many politicians to, to, um, to attack and do away with, with public education because it, it's a thorn in their side. Uh, mm -hmm. If you do away with that, you don't have to worry about taxes, so you turn it over to, to private people to make money on it. And, and, and time and time again, Every piece of research that we look at shows that the schools that were uh, set up to be models of, of innovation are not providing the best education for kids compared to public schools. But that being said, um, 
the, the other big block that we have in education is that we don't fund education the same way we fund defense. Uh, everybody has a, a right to say what they want to pay for education and nobody wants to pay any money. Nobody has the right, right. to say what they want to pay for defense and, and they seem to be doing fine with the money that they're getting. And, and, and right. education would just need a fraction of that budget, that defense budget to be successful. And that's all I really had to say. So I'd like to thank you guys for, for, for being here tonight. I know you're, you're going to continue, but I have to leave. So thank you. Okay. And well, well, we're, I think we're going to wrap up also. Uh, so but, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank Thanks, you Tom. definitely for your uh, insights and your input and uh, for everybody uh, who has uh, uh, chatted with us either inside the IMs or uh, who has uh, stepped up uh, or raised their hand. Uh, definitely want to uh, thank you. So just a, a parting thought. Um, as we wrap things up, I want I want you guys to take this with you. Don't tell them about the year when you told me how to get in touch with Paul. Yes. Okay. Um, so <laughs> I was like, what is that? Um, so just as a parting thought to take with you, think about this. Where do we go from here? What can educators do to make a difference in the local, state, federal landscape of education? So think about that. And as you're thinking about that, um, I came across. I did a little bit of research because one of the things I wanted to make sure that you guys walked away with was. You know, we hear all the time, talk to your legislator, reach out to your legislator. Well, that's all well and good, but what's the most effective way to reach out to your legislator? And here is, in, in my research and, and reading multiple different sites and, you know, you can call it fake news, real news, whatever kind of news. This is based on my research. What I have found is you can email and you can tweet and you can reach to them on Facebook and all those other kinds of things. But the number one most effective way that you can reach out to any of your elect elected officials is to pick up the phone and call them from Old different from, from people. Analogs. Yeah, I mean, really, from, from <laughs> folks that used to work with politicians who still work with politicians. They say, hands down, when you pick up the phone and you call them, you've got now you may get their staffer, but still you have that staffer on the phone. It's interpersonal. You're talking directly. And they say that that gets further down the line than any other form of communication. So I definitely recommend, as you think about where we go from here and what you can do to make a difference, pick up the phone and call your legislator. And thank you guys so, so much for joining us. Thank you very much to Mitch for inviting us. We didn't get to cover half the stuff we wanted to, so that may be a future discussion. We'll see. I don't know, but uh, if we're invited I, back, that's a <laughs> yeah. I, but we definitely appreciate everybody who took time out of their evening to come and, and share your ideas and, and, and let us spout ours and share ours, and, and we appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I had I had a lot of fun tonight. I'm sorry I spouted off and on, on a few of the things I'm passionate passionate about or or raised some questions that um, you know that I thought at least should be raised, whether whether or not I I, I believe in them. But uh, it was, to me, this was very enjoyable. I I hope everybody else enjoyed it also. Um, I see people stayed, so uh, I think so. And um, next time uh, you guys are here, um, you know, I I hope some of you who came come back again and um, and are willing to come and take the stage and and, and talk. So uh, okay. I'll see you. I'll see you online. Um, I'll yeah. see you at another EdChat Interactive uh, uh, sometime, hopefully soon. And will you be at ISTE or? Uh, we actually we don't or know yet. We won't, or... we, won't be, we won't be doing live coverage at ISTE. We may be we may ISTE. we may be there. If you see us, catch us. We'll be tweeting it out. Right. Just okay. well, like I said, go to Google, type in EduTech guys one word, you'll find us. Uh, just to throw out the day show was on with Code Moji, twenty year old entrepreneur who started coding for kids. All uh, with using emojis, and it gets bigger in Java, CSS, the whole bit. Really interesting kid. Talks a lot about education and his path through education. It'll be up tonight about 11 o'clock Central Time. So if you want to catch it on iTunes, you can listen to the podcast. Okay. Well, great. Okay. See you soon. Have a good evening. And uh, awesome. this is Mitch. This is Mitch Weisberg uh, signing off for EdChat Interactive. And I hope you liked our experiment tonight. And I hope we get to do this again. Uh, take care and see you soon. Bye.